Welcome to Alternatives 2013. Building inclusive communities, valuing every voice. And I hope in the next few days we can be a model for the rest of the world by creating a loving and healing learning community right here. Sometimes our voices talk, sometimes we hear voices. I myself have come a long way to be here. I've been hospitalized, um, I've been given a diagnosis, and I've made a big turnaround in my life. Everybody is capable of experiencing these states. We still have a long path to travel when it comes to changing the hearts and minds of Americans. I want you to know that I value, and SAMHSA values, your voice every voice. Your participation in the development of behavioral health policy helps to make sure we as a nation get it right. And we're seen around the world as a beacon for everyone. And I hope to see the day when nobody will be told that they will not recover. Because we are the hope of communities. We don't want just a life in the community. We want to rebuild our communities. We can do it. Just like the bats. You know the story of the bats on the Congress Street Bridge? At first they were a nuisance. And people in Texas and Austin said, get rid of those bats. We don't want those bats. Do you know what they are today? They are the pride of Austin. We have a lot to offer. In Europe, we're called experts by experience, and that's what we are. The first actual alternatives conference was 1985 in Baltimore, but the roots are much, much earlier. The roots really uh, go back to the beginning of the consumer survivor movement in the U.S. A number of groups grew up in the 70s, uh, Network Against Psychiatric Assault in the Bay Area, Mental Patient Liberation Front, of which I was a member in the Boston area, Philadelphia, New York. And these people, they, they were brilliantly understood that the mental health system as it existed then, and still unfortunately a lot of it exists the same way, was taking away people's power, taking away people's rights, instead of helping people to get on with their life. Over the next four days in Austin will be the epicenter of the recovery movement. I love uh, the peer movement in America, uh, which is way ahead of developments in our country, in the Netherlands. What I do is I take people from the Netherlands or other Europe European countries over to America and show them uh, peer-run programs. What I see is that people are more in control, they develop their own programs, and they make them successful. We people create systems where people get in, but they can't get out. Peer-run programs, or the peer movement, are more creative than anybody else, thinking about how can we offer people uh, the opportunity to, to develop skills, uh, to do a job, to have a relationship, to have a house, uh, and live meaningful life, lives like you and me. Some of us, many of us in this room, have stories of profound trauma that we carry with us. But I love Carl Jung's archetype of the wounded healer. And it reveals to us that when we go through those core wounds, our, our deepest traumas, we go through a kind of a rebirth. And we go forth with the courage and a wisdom that comes from having faced that most painful place. All behavior has meaning. I'm not going to judge your behavior, because if I judge your behavior, I miss the point of meaning. All behavior has meaning. When we judge behavior, we may miss the opportunity for understanding the meaning behind behavior. We've got to value every single person in our community because that's who make up, makes up the community. There's a huge divide between intent and impact. The National Institute of Mental Health Director Thomas Insel announced that psychiatry's standard treatment for people diagnosed with schizophrenia and other psychosis needs to change. You know, what I'm wanting to see is the community working together so that we can give people whatever it is that they would like to have so that they can find their own path. 
We are engaged in a struggle for the heart and soul of this country. They claim that we don't really reach people who are severely mentally distressed, as they say, mentally ill. I would contend that we do. How many people here, just out of curiosity, would say that someone might have classified them in that situation at some point in their life? We are the scapegoats for the public violence. Outpatient commitment is running throughout the whole country, but instead of the old hospitals and all of us being committed, anyone diagnosed with severe mental illness being committed to hospitals, we will now be committed to the community. Yeah, this mental health recovery movement is another sort of stream of this overall, overall civil rights movement. Well, we're bringing empathy and compassion, which are things we've heard about from you know, our different religions or our schools or wherever we come from, but we're not really seeing it so much in responses. When we need help, we're not seeing those things in action. We're not seeing compassion and empathy in our services that are there to support us. We're seeing coercion and control and loss of um, autonomy and loss of self, loss of hope. So people can and do recover and uh, we're the ones that drive it and we need to be at the table. Nothing about us without us. These are all our themes. These come from us. Every significant advance in the mental health field in the last 20 years has been inspired by people with lived experience. This freedom train will not derail. This freedom train is carrying precious cargo. Our brothers and sisters, daughters and sons, our past, present, and most importantly, our future. It reminds me of Gandhi, and, and we're trying to free millions of people. And Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight with you, and then you win. We're at the fighting part. They ignored us for a long time. Oh, yeah, oh. You don't have to worry, oh, they're crazy. Then they laugh at us, now they're fighting with us. We're to the third stage. It won't be long. You and me, the keynote is democracy.